Okay, so here's exactly where we left off during the last uh, video, and I wanted to pick up on this conclusion because it's packed with lots of information. Okay, um, so let me, well, so it says it appears that adding red food coloring to a sucrose solution significantly decreases sweetness ratings. Um, a couple of things. First, from a research uh, perspective, um, when, when my student and I, uh, when we did this research, um, we actually thought that adding red food coloring would increase sweetness ratings of the solution. Because when you're looking at it, right, one is clear and one is red. And we thought people might rate it as more sweet, um, even though, like I said, the food coloring has no flavor at all. Um, and in fact, I was so convinced, and this is a lesson, this is a lesson, important lesson in science and a lesson in research. Um, I was convinced that we would see sweeter people rating it as sweeter, but we didn't. In fact, I was so convinced of it that when we collected these data, we had more than eight people, but when we collected these data, I actually did not believe them at first, even though as a scientist, you're sort of trained to trust the data, what the data are telling you. But I wasn't quite sure because I thought we we're going to see the exact opposite. Now, we replicated the experiment, and basically we found the same thing with the second replication. And so now, and this is one of the phrases that makes me very nervous when I hear it from scientists, people say, well, those findings don't make any sense. And I'm like, listen, if you've done the experiment carefully, and especially if you've replicated it, the findings make sense. If they don't appear to make sense, then you need to sort of change your way of thinking. And so we were trying to figure out what might explain these results. We replicated it. We saw that it decreased. Well, as it turns out, what happens is people have different expectations with what they're about to taste, right? If I give someone a clear sucrose solution, there's not much expectation, even though I, I tell them it's gonna be a sweet solution, but it's clear, so how sweet is it gonna be, I don't know. If I give someone a red sucrose solution, they assume that it's gonna be sweeter. And so that when they taste it, relative to their expectations, it's not as sweet. Everybody with me? With a clear solution, they don't have any expectations, so the sweetness gets rated the way it is. When you, when you have a red solution, the subjects think it's going to be sweeter, and so then when they taste its actual sweetness, they rate, it's, it's less than what it was expected, so they rate it as less sweet. So that's sort of the science, and, and I spent several years after that studying taste perception and what kinds of factors, other than what's in the solution, <coughs> what kinds of factors influence um, how people perceive the, the sweetness. But let's get back to the statistical a little bit here, and I want to explain this conclusion, because this is what's going to be in the um, journal as your conclusion. All of this is sort of behind the scenes, okay? So first of all, sometimes people get... Um, are a little bit surprised when I tell them that science really can't prove anything and neither can statistics. But we can show what things are probable, what things are highly probable, what things are improbable, okay? But this is a probability statement and what we're saying here, let's focus on the stats first and I'll go back into the conclusion, okay? Because my red sucrose solution was so far out, in this way, decreased, I'm saying, and let's focus here, okay, the probability that the null is true is less than 5% of the time. And the reason I'm saying that is because there's the middle 95%, and our red group is here, 
could that does that look like a clear solution group it doesn't this is where we expect it is it possible listen carefully to this now is it possible that we would get a clear sucrose solution group of eight that would rate it this low the answer is yeah it's possible but it's highly improbable in fact the probability is less than 0.05 um, so that's what this means I'm going to tell you two different versions. The easiest to think about, I'm going to get rid of this right now, is to say the probability of the null hypothesis is less than 0.05, right? That's another way that you could write this. It's typically just written like this. This is what you may want to think. The probability, the probability that the null is true is less than 5%. That's why we, we, we rejected the null. The probability that the null is true is less than 5%. That's why we rejected the null. That's what this says. Another more um, maybe elaborate way to say it is the probability that we would get something like this if it was clear solution is less than 5%. Okay, It's the same thing as what we're saying here. The probability that we would get something like that from clear is less than 5%. And so, therefore, it appears that the red is really something different. Okay, And the fact that this there is some probability that we could be wrong in rejecting this, not very high. I always start my conclusions with this. It appears that adding red food coloring to sucrose solution decreases sweetness ratings. I didn't say I'm proving this, okay, because it's a probability statement. But I'm not putting my dollar on anything that occurs less than 5% of the time. It's just that's, that's not a likely outcome, okay? So what I want to do now is to do another example. We'll do the five steps, and again, I'll go through and sort of remind people what each of the steps is doing and why we're doing it. Um, but we can do it a little bit more quickly this time, perhaps. Okay, so let's go to um, another example and let me go back to, let me go back to reaction times okay let me go back to reaction times and what we'll do is we'll do our simple reaction time um, setup and um, let's remember we had our so this is normally what we see is a reaction time of 258 milliseconds and I think that we said the the standard deviation was 37 milliseconds. That's what we'll use. Okay. Let's do this question. Let's have people come into the lab, and what we'll do is we will give them one ounce of alcohol. So that would be the equivalent of a can of beer, or a glass of wine, or a shot of whiskey. Okay. We'll give them one ounce of alcohol. We're going to wait 15 to 20 minutes because I want the alcohol to get into the system. And of course, we'll have, you know, this will be IRB approved, and we'll have, um, you know, um, tell people what they're doing, and so on and so forth. We're going to do this all safely here. And then we'll get them back on the reaction time, so that we're at the computer. Uh, when you see the letter X, you press a bar, blah, 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 you know, just like we did with Bob. Except this time we're going to have Let's do this. Let's do this with 10 people. Oop, with 10, not 100. We'll get 10 people into the lab, and um, we'll do, put them through the reaction time after the alcohol and see what it looks like. OK, so let's do um, step one. We're going to set up our hypotheses. The null hypothesis would say that Compared to normal, or sober, I guess, if you want to say that, when we give one ounce of alcohol, 
we're going to see the same reaction time. And when I say the same, of course, we're talking about that curve. So it's going to be around 258, but we need to take into consideration the standard deviation. Okay? Um, of course, we could actually write this in a different way and say that um, the alcohol group will have a mean of 258 milliseconds, right? All I'm doing is replacing that. So there's two ways that you could say this. The experimental hypothesis, or what we will say is the alternative hypothesis, is that compared to normal or sober, the alcohol group will be different and again, I'm doing a what's called a non-directional hypothesis. Now, here's a confusing part. Sometimes it's called a bi-directional hypothesis because I'm going to test for either direction. That's why it's called bi-directional. Sometimes it's called non-directional because we're not choosing a direction. Okay, that's what we're going to do. As opposed to doing a directional hypothesis, which would mean I'm choosing, I'm going to say, Alcohol is going to increase reaction time or alcohol is going to decrease reaction time. I do not want to do that. I want to give myself the opportunity to look at both directions. Remember the red food coloring. We found a result that was the opposite of what we thought. Well, so sad, too bad. I mean, it's the opposite of what we thought. But it's a good thing that I wasn't just testing to see if that red food coloring increased taste perception, right, the sweetness, I tested both directions. So it's called bi-directional, or sometimes it's called non-directional because I'm not choosing a direction. Another way we could write this is to say, well, the alcohol group is going to be something different than 258, okay? All I'm doing here is replacing the normal mean because it was given with the 258. Now, which is better? I've seen people use both, and so it depends on who your supervisor is, where you went to graduate school, or what you want to do. Um, in terms of advice for a student, if I'm responding on an exam, hell, I'm going to put both. I'm going to show that professor that I really know that you can do this two different ways. Step one. Step two, we're going to use our standard alpha level of 0.05, and that means a z-score of plus or minus 1.96. And again, this comes from our normal curve. This means that we're going to reject the null if the data goes into the extreme 5%. And that's defined by a z-score of 1.96, either positive or negative. Okay? You can use different levels. This is the standard level. Okay? For this class, we're going to sort of stick with that level. Three, let's collect our data and do our statistical analyses. Okay? We have 10 people. Let's say that the mean for those 10 people, this is the alcohol group. Let's say the mean is 277.80. This is reaction time. That means that they're slower than normal. But what we need to do is to determine whether this is significantly slower or if it still falls in that middle 95%, right? And so here is, uh, here's what the graph would look like. And I'm going to, I'm not going to always do this. So let's do this again. Here is, this is our sober, our normal or our sober. This is what it would look like, 258. Standard deviation of 37. Here's the step that you need to remember that if I have a sample of 10, I certainly don't want to compare an M value 
to these our individual values. So we're going to do the little arrow thing, okay? And that is because we know the central limit theorem, we know that this distribution is going to have a mean of 258. It's going to have a standard error, that is the standard deviation of this distribution is going to be what? 37 divided by the square root of 10. 37 divided by the square root of 10. Okay? This is, the, is a really important uh, step that you have to remember. If you have samples, compare them to samples. If I had an individual, I'm going to compare it to individuals. If I have a sample, compare it to samples. If it's individuals, compare it to individuals. How do we figure out what samples look like? Well, that's why this is called the central limit theorem, uh, it, because it's a theorem, because it's so important. So that's what we're going to do. Okay. So it's 258. Thirty-seven divided by the square root of ten, which is. Let's see what that is. Thirty-seven divided by three point one six, so eleven point seven one. Okay, so this is what the sampling distribution of sober people looks like for samples of n equal ten. This is what the sampling distribution of sober people look like when the samples are n equal 10. If you need to go back and look at the central limit theorem video again, I would encourage you to do that. So our z-score here is, we're going to do this. We're going to look at what we saw with our alcohol group. We're going to compare that to the sober group. We're going to divide by this. In other words, our z-score formula is our z-score formula is m minus mu sub m divided by sigma sub m. Okay, that's what I'm doing here. So our z-score is, let's calculate this, 277.8 minus 258 divided by 11.71. So it's a z-score of 1.69. Okay. Now remember, we're going to reject the null. If the z-score is above 1.96 in the positive, below 1.96 in the negative, this is 1.69. And so here's where our alcohol group is. They do have uh, you know, higher than average reaction time, but it doesn't go into the tails, which is where we were going to uh, reject the null. And so we need to make an assessment now about the null hypothesis, right? Does it look like the alcohol group comes from a distribution where the mean is 258? And what I'm saying here is if this is 258 here, this is what I would expect to see. And in fact, my alcohol group looks like it's an expected value anyway, even though it's a little bit elevated, it looks like it could come from the sober, uh, the sober group, okay? And so I'm going to now fail to reject the null. That is, this could be the case, 
And so I'm going to fail to reject the null. Fail to reject the null. So step four. In this case, I'll fail to reject the null. And then step five. It appears, I'm still going to do that, because all we're doing is probability statements. It appears that one ounce of alcohol does not significantly affect, with an A, with an A, because it's a verb, um, reaction time. This is not my opinion, it's based on data, so I'm going to report 1.69 semicolon. Now, P greater than 0.05, period at the end. What we're saying is the probability that we would see something like this from sober people is greater than 5% of the time. The probability that we would see this with sober people happens more than 5% of the time, so we fail to reject, and we're going to say doesn't appear to significantly uh, affect reaction time. Okay, that's how it works. Now, I might present this at a conference, and this is what we do as scientists, right? I'm presenting this at a conference, and I'm talking about my reaction time apparatus, and I'm talking about my statistics, and I failed to reject the null. Uh, this kind of outcome would come from sober people more than 5% of the time, so this is my conclusion. And um, somebody raises their hand, and they said, well, Dr. Speck, this is very interesting, I and mean, you're not going to argue with my statistics, and if they don't believe what I found, they might go and replicate the experiment in their own lab, or I might replicate it in my own lab or whatever. But somebody might raise their hand and say, well, you know, this is all fine and dandy, but um, you're doing this task as a simple reaction time task. So people drink one ounce of alcohol, and it doesn't appear to influence their reaction time, but really what I'm concerned about um, is, you know, when you're driving a car, for example, or operating, you know, heavy equipment, um, this is really a task that's not just a simple reaction time task. Have you done this research with a driving simulator? And I would be, I would respond to that person by not getting all defensive and nasty. I would be like, oh, huh, that's an interesting point. And um, what that does for me is that gives me an idea. Maybe we should do this in a driving simulator. Of course, our campus doesn't have a driving simulator. So I might ask this person that brought up the question. I'm like, well, do you have a, do you have a driving simulator that we might do this in? And the um, person said, yeah, we use it all the time. I said, oh, well, maybe we can do a collaborative project. You see the difference between sort of responding in a, in a, knee-jerk kind of a defensive way and most of the time when we're at these conferences people aren't being nasty they're trying to help you you know they may see a problem in your research that you didn't know you had or they might have good suggestions for you i remember one of the best suggestions i ever got was uh from a former professor that i had from graduate school when he came to a talk of mine and he gave me a suggestion about the taste research stuff and it really helped me out it's great. Okay, so this then will be a kind of a double uh, example because what we're going to do now is we're going to do this study because there are other lessons here. I'm a teacher after all, right? And we'll replicate the study using a driving simulator. Now, one of the things with a driving simulator is that certainly we expect that the reaction times are going to be higher. And by driving simulator, here's what we're going to do. We're going to set somebody up 
in, in a thing where they're watching a video as if they're driving and the gas pedal and the brake pedal and the steering all will af affect what they see on the screen. You know, it's a simulator. And so we'll have the person driving, let's say at 30 miles an hour, and then all of a sudden a little you know, ball and a kid comes out into the road. So you got to put the brake on as soon as you can. But all this stuff going on, uh, it takes more time to respond. And so let's say for the simulator, let's say normal reaction time is uh, 666, oh my goodness, uh, milliseconds with a standard deviation of, let's say, 37. Okay. Excuse me. Let me change it. Let's say standard deviation is 49. Because you would expect more variability when you have a more complex system. That's why I uh, change this. Okay. And um, so now what we're going to do is we're going to, um, let's say, we'll do another sample of 10. And let's say the mean for this group who gets alcohol is, um, let's say, uh, 721.2. Okay. So now let's do our five-step hypothesis testing procedure um, for this group and or for this experiment. And so step number one, we're going to do the hypotheses, right? So here's the null hypothesis. The alcohol group is going to be the same as what we see normally, okay? No, I just switched these around, right? And I started with this one. If you think about this, this shouldn't be throwing you, okay? But you need to think about this. We're, we're not going to do regimented, no thinking rules. Uh, shall we do it this way? We could say the alcohol group is going to be the same as the normal simulator group, right? And then our, um, can we fit it down here? Yeah, we can fit it here. Our alcohol group is going to be different than 666.50, okay, perhaps. Or we could say the alcohol group is different than what we would see normally, okay? Step two, use the alpha level of 0.05. That means a z-score plus or minus 1.96. Pretty standard. Let's do our statistical analyses, okay? And we're going to do a z-score now for a sample. So that means we need the sample mean. That's going to be our alcohol mean. That's the one we are comparing to what we see normally with the standard deviation of what we see normally, okay? Now, by the way, uh, I want to point this out. There's a potential for a little bit of confusion here. Um, and for those of you who think that the book is more important than me, um, I'm here to tell you, you might want to think differently. I'm sorry. Well, I'm not really sorry. The book uses this formula sometimes, I think. I don't like this formula. Just because this and this are equal in value doesn't mean that they're the same thing. If we have a sample, you compare the sample to the mean for all the samples to the standard deviation for all the samples, right? Everything is M'd here. Here, what they're doing is they're comparing a sample, they're going back to the individual mean, they're going back to the sample standard deviation. I don't like this. Just because these two values are equal, just because you'll get the same outcome, doesn't mean that conceptually it's the same. If you have $20 in your pocket and I have $20 in my pocket, it doesn't mean that those $20 are the same, right? 
So I don't like this so much, and it's not accurate. Once we convert, remember the conversion? Okay, I wanted to try to skip it this time. These are individual scores, and then we do the conversion. Okay, so these are M's here. Once we're over here, everything is over here. Right? So I'm going to compare my mean to this to this. I'm not going to take the mean for the sample, then come back here, then go back here. It doesn't make any sense. So conceptually, I'm doing a better job than the book. Computationally, you're going to get the same answer. It matters if you want to understand what's going on. Okay, enough of the soapbox. Here we go. Here's my alcohol sample in the simulator. Here's what we normally see in the simulator. Here is the standard error for the, um, where are we at here? The standard error will be 49 divided by the square root of 10. Okay, so let's do that. 49 divided by 3.16, so it's 15.51. So we have a z-score now, 721.2 minus 666.5 equals 54.7 divided by 15.51 for a z-score of 3.53. Wow. Three and a half standard errors away from the mean. If we were to draw that curve, this group is way out there, man. Way out there. Beyond 1.96. Do you want me to draw here? Okay. Here's my sampling distribution of means for groups of 10 sober people, 666.5, 15.51. There's my alcohol group, okay? Now that is what I call far out, man, okay? That's out there. And so I'm gonna go back to my null hypothesis and say, does it look like the alcohol like the sample that I have came from a distribution that looks, that has a mean of 666.50, right? Now, there is a question, right? People say, well, this is an M, and you're looking at a mu. Well, remember, we're trying to guess what the bag looks like. This is my best guess, okay, for what this looks like. And it doesn't look like it comes from here. If, it, if the alcohol group came from this distribution, we would expect something in there, okay? So now, by virtue of this, we're going to now reject the null, okay? Step five. It appears that one ounce of alcohol significantly increases reaction time. And what I would do if I was writing this, because I want to be as clear as possible, it significantly increases reaction time. I'm going to put in parentheses, makes people slower. Okay. Because I'm not sure that everyone's going to understand if I say increase reaction time. You know, oh, I thought increase was a good thing, right? That's oftentimes people think bigger is better. It's not the case, right? Makes people slower. Um, and then I guess I could put this in the same parentheses. I'm going to show people why I'm saying this. What was our uh, 
z score of 3.53. That's why I'm saying this. P less than 0 0.05. I'm saying the probability that the null is true is less than 5%. Okay? Now, a couple of things with this example. Lots of lessons to be learned, folks. Lots of lessons to be learned. Number one, and this has to do with being a good science consumer, as well as a good citizen, by the way. If you look back and you look at the conclusion from the other study, it said that one, alcohol, one ounce of alcohol did not affect reaction time. This one says one ounce of alcohol did affect reaction time. Now I'm going to tell you, there's a good proportion of the population would say, oh, these scientists don't know what they're doing because one said alcohol doesn't affect reaction time, one says alcohol does affect reaction time. You see what I mean? This is the headline. People are going to say, oh, these scientists don't agree. But you know the difference in the experiment, right? You know the difference in the experiment. You'd have to read the method section. You'd have to read more than the headline, folks, more than the headline. And that is, the first experiment was done with simple reaction time. If all you're concerned about is simple reaction times, then one ounce of alcohol may not affect your reaction time. And by the way, all these data are made up, but I make them up to, to illustrate a point. So with just simple reaction time, one ounce of alcohol doesn't affect you. When you're in a driving simulator, one ounce of alcohol significantly um, increases your reaction time. And this may be the difference between life and death, right? In fact, both of these studies looked at alcohol. Both of them looked at reaction time. But the difference in the task is quite um, remarkable. That is worthy of a remark. And in fact, there is absolutely no uh, discrepancy between these two findings. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a completely different task. If you look at the headline, it may look like they're contradicting one another when they absolutely are not. Okay? Please, folks, even if you don't care about statistics and you don't do anything with them in your career, I think this is a really nice example of the potential misinterpretation of the fact that when people are doing studies, sometimes the devil's in the detail, okay? Sometimes you have to look and say, oh, well, why did they find different results? Was there a difference in the experiment? In other words, be a little bit more critical. Now, if both of these were uh, simple reaction times and one found a difference and one didn't, well, then it's a whole other issue, okay? But these two experiments are really not very comparable, except they used alcohol in reaction time. All right, so enough soapbox, I guess. Um, another thing that I want to point out here, this is huge. This is a huge z-score, okay? And I want to go back to the curve here, okay? And if we're here at a z-score of 1.96, that's the middle 95%, right? And then there's 2.5 and 2.5. And but we could go out further. If we go out to a z-score, and you guys can look this up if you'd like. A z-score of plus or minus 2.58 defines the middle 99% and the extreme 1%. And our z-score here is even beyond that. Our z-score is beyond that. If I were doing this study and I got these results, I would probably change this, like most scientists, and say p less than 0.01. Now, for this class, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But I'm just telling you, you're going to see this in the literature. I'm, going to, I'm explaining to you where that comes from. If you have a z-score this far out, that it goes beyond 
the 1% mark, oftentimes scientists will do this. And that typically gets interpreted as I'm more confident in my results because they're way out there. Okay. Now, that being said, the, a minority of statisticians and researchers will say, oh, wait a minute, but in step two, you're using the 5%, so this should match the 5%. And I'm like, well, this is much more standard, okay? So again, there's not a rule, right? People have different beliefs about this. It's just telling you either way, you're going to reject the null. This is usually indicating that you're more confident, okay? People that would argue that would say something like, well, I mean, if you say that your sister is pregnant, um, and then you say, no, she's really pregnant. I mean, some people say, well, what does that mean? If you use 0.05, you're already saying you have a significant effect. It, does this mean it's more significant? Well, it usually means more confident, okay? A lot of people will argue this is a um, sort of a, you know, you either say you have an effect or you don't. Um, this would be like saying a person's more pregnant. Or if you watch a uh, violent movie and they say they killed the guy, they really killed him. I mean, what does that mean? He's either dead or he's not dead, right? So, um, but this is more traditional if you have such a large uh, z-score. For this class, just use 0.05. Let's make it simple, okay? Okay, so three examples of the hypothesis testing. Next video, we'll probably do one more, and then we're going to move on from there. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions.